Now, good morning. It's a pleasure to be hosting you today. My name is George Beatty. Um, I am actually a farmer, but I also sit on the Rowing Australia board, and I'm also on the Four Square Advisory Board. So there's a lot of panel that I don't have a hat to jump on. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be moderating today. Let me also um, just start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we meet on today, the Wurundjeri people. Um, let me pay my respects to the elders both past, present and emerging, and um, particularly to anyone who might be in the audience today. Um, and I support the Uluru Statement um, and the need for truth telling, and um, so that we can work together to heal the earth of the past. Um, now, this was also my last event last year before lockdown, so I'm thrilled that we can be here and it's safe enough not to be wearing masks. Now, I will be speaking all around the country today because you have to go to me for 45 minutes and then we'll be done with question time. So we've got about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Please um, have a think of those because um, I don't know, last time hands went up very quickly and we can only get for a few. And we've got a very tall group here today. Um, now, so we're here to discuss our international women's well, the International Women's Week, um, to discuss the, the challenges and the, the, the progression of equality. Um, I, I think it's really important, this is different from last year, is that um, women have actually been more adversely affected in the workplace um, than men in the last 12 months because of COVID. Um, I'm really keen to hear your experiences of the last 12 months. Um, let me start by just giving you a little bit of a snapshot of the last four months. So this is some data from the World Economic Forum. Um, so we're going to be on the front line. We're going to make up 80% of hospital workers, 84% of general medical practice, 77% of pathology and diagnostic imaging, 82% of aged care workers. So significant. Um, and there are more women than men working in casual employment. Um, and that's the employment department, a job keeper. So I started my own business, so it's a bit of a, um, a hole there with, with job keeper, so it was a disaster. Um, government subsidies, we could, we could say that we need towards more male dominated um, industries, such as construction. Um, and for me, this ties in with the stat of representation of women in politics. So we were 32nd in 2006, um, and now we're 59th in 2020, and so it just, it, 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 that saves me. Um, Australia is ranked number one for educational attainment. Um, this hasn't changed since 2006, but what we've seen in the last 12 months is that there's been 86,000 fewer women involved in the tertiary compared to 21,000 men. Um, and so this was mostly women over 25. And in terms of labor force participation, participation female and, and, and female leadership, um, we were 15th in 2006, and now we're 44th in 2020 and 2020. So really, really interesting um, stats. If education is not the issue, um, you know, what are some of the factors contributing? And that's exactly what we need to discuss today. Um, I would like to start off with a bit of a check-in, um, emotional, intellectual, workplace, culture, whatever it is you want to share, um, how are we going? Alright, first up. So, uh, hello everyone. Fantastic to be here. My name is Rob Bolton, uh, and I'm the CEO of Sports Trade, uh, which is uh, which is April. So, checking in, I am just delighted to be seeing faces in front of me. George, this is screens. Been a long, uh, been a long road. So, uh, I'm uh, I'm really, really positive. Uh, we've got a 2032 Olympics target which we're heading towards um, and really excited about getting more people active and playing playing sport. And are you back in the office? In Canberra, I'm back in the office. have been for a little while because Canberra don't know what COVID is. <laughs> but, but Melbourne, Victoria, not? Uh, yeah, we're back in the office. We've got an office in Burke Street, so I, I go in there one day a week as well. Um, so I'm Katie Pinsenkar, co-founder of 776 BC. We're a performance and apparel business based here in Melbourne, for those who don't In terms of 
where I'm at and where my business is at, um, we're feeling, you know, I guess pretty optimistic of the fact that what was a really challenging year, I think, for a lot of people and, and businesses. Um, I think there's been some really good lessons that came out of the last 12 months, um, particularly for, uh, well, for us as, as an organisation, you know, we're a small, agile business, we were able to adapt quite quickly. Um, but it did prove to us that remote working is something that can work. Um, and I think that was a really, really good lesson. I'm sure we'll talk more about that, Georgia. Um, but I think also uh, it's sort of driven, sort of highlighted, I guess, that, um, yeah, it's sort of driven, I guess, more accountability amongst staff team as well, and individuals within our team. And a lot of opportunities for younger people within our team to actually take a little bit more responsibility. Um, some of the challenges we can kind of go into, but we are feeling positive as we enter you know, this year. Um, and as a team, we're now operating in a hybrid model, so a combination of both some at home work and some in the office, um, which we're focusing that time more on more collaborative work and, and more of that workshop itself. Oh, hi everyone, um, like Rob, it's really great to see humans, so thank you for the opportunity this morning to be here with you. Uh, my name is Lee Russell, I'm the Program Director at Champions of Change Coalition for the Sport Program, I'm sure I'll explain that as we go along. Up until November of last year, I was the, the CEO of Swimming Australia, and I hate the word former, so I'm trying not to use that. But I am the former CEO, and former CEO of Nibble Victoria as well. Um, spent a long time working in sport, teacher by trade. The last 12 months have been uh, full on. This, this 2021 though, I think really represents an enormous opportunity to capitalise on the, the learnings from 2020. So that's what I'm fully focused on. I did, I, I, sorry, what I should say is I'm very grateful for little things at the moment. Schools, open, um, being able to see friends, so yeah, I really, really am grateful for those things that we probably took for granted a little while ago. Thanks for that, Lee. Um, I might actually jump to you because you've had a very interesting last 12 months um, and not to focus on the challenging side, but you actually physically moved your family. Um, tell us where you've been over the last 12 months. Well, I didn't know I was moving my family. I uh, So my husband, for better or for worse, is married to the mob of Carlton. Um, he is the high performance director and uh, came home one day and said, looks like we're going to Queensland for a couple of weeks. If you want to come, you have to come tomorrow. At that time, um, we didn't really have any more information than that. And as a CEO with three kids, I felt like it might be better to keep this all together and to get his support, naively get his support, um, as I was trying to navigate staff stand downs and all those sorts of things. So off we went to Queensland and I thought we'd be there for a couple of weeks and we ended up being there for six months. So four months in the hub, um, as they called it, and then we stayed on to, I put one of my kids in school who wasn't doing too well up there. Uh, so she could sort of get back into some rhythm and have a bit of an adventure of, of Queensland school. So it's been, yeah, it's been an enormous 12 months. Um, I learned uh, how to live out of a bag. So I've come home and completely done the uh, Marie Kondo and, and just culled everything in our house. Uh, and, you know, we had big things like we sold our house and all those sorts of things in the middle of it. So, yeah, it's, it, it's been a massive time of transition, perhaps focusing or learning about the things that really matter. But I did find it really tough uh, being a CEO and trying to, I guess, hold um, people up, you know, our staff and our athletes, while my three kids and I are on a little table in a hotel room. But I will say that uh, it, it was enormously necessary and certainly, you know, through sport, people's livelihoods were being impacted so dramatically that we all knew why you know, we were there, but I did find it extraordinarily challenging. Now, Rob, I know you've got older kids that are out of school, they're in uni, but N equals two then. Who was in charge of homeschooling out of in, in your relationships? Uh, me? No, well, no, more than, well, you were 
You, you I was in charge of homeschooling and I did a wonderful job. <laughs> we didn't have anyone at school. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, no, I'm more interested from um, Lee and Kate. I mean, oh, just, just, just N equals two here. Because I haven't seen that many... Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of um, anecdotal evidence of, about challenges, but I feel like we haven't done any sort of formal research yet. And so if we just take the experiences of two people here that have got kids at home, or in your partnership, who actually did the majority of the schooling? Or was it 50-50? So my kids are little, which was actually a bit of a bonus, I guess, in terms of we had to have to do all my schooling. So we had a three-year-old and a seven-month-old. So my experience uh, over the last 12 months was kind of, uh, I guess, interesting also because I went through a pregnancy and giving birth. Uh, having a newborn during COVID lockdown number two, and a month still so uh, leading the business. So um, that that was interesting. But in terms of the who shared the load and how we sort of spread responsibilities amongst myself and my husband, um, we actually I think did a pretty good job of sharing it between us. Um, we're a team at work, so I co-founded in Sensitivity BC with my husband Cameron, who's a former athlete. Uh, he rode uh, for Australia in a couple of Olympics. Um, and yeah, we found the company together. So we're a team at home and at work. Um, so I think in some ways that has also it equipped us for you know, what life under a you know, COVID terms could, it could be like, but we are very much a team and we do share responsibilities. Um, but we do have an added challenge, which was a new one thrown into the mix, um, which didn't mean that there's obviously certain things that Mark is a little bit probably more equipped to do than Dad, um, and we sort of had to readjust. So he ended up doing all the cooking, which was quite nice, and to be honest, we've kept that, and I'm um, quite enjoying that at the moment. So I'm just hanging on to that little one for a little while older. Um, Lee, tell me about your, your experience. Um, it's really hard when two of you have really two full-on jobs uh, that never sleep. Uh, if I'm honest, I'm, I'm kind of the captain of the homeschooling. But what I, it was just sort of situational, but what I found so extraordinary was that, and so jarring to me, was they just sort of sent them home from school one day and said, that's it, you, you, you now are in charge of their schooling, if it's particularly in the first lockdown. And my, one of my kids was like finished by 10 o'clock in the morning. It's like, well, how well, I've got another nine meetings on Zoom to go and then other stuff. So I just found I just found the responsibility all of a sudden really, really challenging as a working mum. And I never quite sort of figured it out. Um, some days work, some days I said, that's it, shut the computers, I've had a gut full. And probably had a wine too early. <laughs> I think a few of us went through those ups and downs. Um, but I mean, really, really um, interesting observation. I think mean, education and schooling weren't ready for it either. And so, you know, if they had six months to prepare everyone and sort of write a procedure of how to homeschool, then we'd be fine. But we just we didn't get the, the warning. Um, and I think everyone is reflecting on how they can prepare for this situation again in the future, but also reflecting on, um, you know, how has this changed our culture? All the better, and some things that we might might keep. Um, you know, what are what are some things that we have learnt um, that we we do really want to make the most of them and continue? Um, lots of things. I think we uh, certainly, from my perspective, you know, the um, the power of meeting people personally. I know that that's a real challenge that. Uh, that all organisations are facing, and uh, I'm based in Canberra, and we're certainly, um, you know, we're certainly facing that challenge of getting people back to work. But when we do, there are so many things in meetings uh, and meeting with people personally that you don't get on a, on a screen. So I think, to me, you know, there is a real skill in being able to you know, work out people's mindsets, you know, where they're at. Uh, what I found really difficult uh, during COVID was that people would go on bubble. So they just had their photograph rather than be live, and you really couldn't tell whether, you know, whether they had any issues. And I think being a leader, you know, that's what you want to be able to do. And I, I found that the biggest challenge. So, so again, it was a it was a learning. It was a real, uh, it was a positive and a negative that you know, as a leader, you you want to be able to, you know, uh, read how those people are feeling from a from a mental health perspective. And we're still struggling to get people back to work and. 
as a sitting camera, they really haven't had too much of an impact. So, yeah. and, and of course, the other one is exercise. I, you know, I really struggled in under 11 days of lockdown. I think you know that that was really hard for for me, and I think hard for people to uh, you know to get back into a routine because we didn't know really what was what was happening outside. Maybe two things um, importantly for me, it's similar to Rob, I, I found the Zoom thing, like I'm sure all of you did, just so, um, I don't know, devoid of soul. And and so uh, I remember it was this, this week last year that we all went home for literally again two weeks and then here we are still trying to get our way back there. But I had a really big presentation to do for Sport Australia Hall of Fame actually about a week or so after we um, locked down. And I thought, yeah, I'll use Zoom twice, it'll be fine, I've, I've, I've got this. And I realised, like, very quickly that I was doing a really shit job of it. And, and uh, the presentation, because actually I, I thrive off body language and looking at people in the eye and really engaging and reading a room and all those things. I've really relied on those skills as a, as a leader and all of a sudden all of that was gone. And I got off the Zoom and thought, that was the worst presentation I've ever given. And of course, my girlfriends were texting saying, great job. And I'm like, no. That was crap. Um, but, but it actually made me stop and think about what, how, how do we keep connected if this is going to go on for a long time? And I remembered a, a little secret. I did a bit of TV for Foxtel, um, a little tiny little footy show. Uh, and uh, they used to say, you've got a really serious face. Like, you have to be like a TV presenter or a, a newsreader where they really overpronounce things and look really excited, but on the screen it's 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 kind of looks normal. So I remember thinking, okay, I have to do that. But the energy, like meeting after meeting after meeting, to really look like you're into it, um, is is so uh, you know so much. So that that energy cost, but also then the, the cost of not. Um, Engaging with people one on one, or even from a just in a physical space, I think so important to us as, as humans and for human performance. Um, the, the the second one, I think, that as a as a lesson is we can change if we want to. Uh, when when necessity is the mother of invention, all of a sudden things that were barriers or impediments just just melted away, and we found a way. I never doubt that humans can find a way, and so when we're talking about things like equity and so on, we can find a way, we can find the skills, and we can do it if we really, really want to. So I think that's what really come out strongly for me. Yeah, I mean, it is a funny thing on, on Zoom. It's almost, if you, if you lose that sort of reflective journey, it's just about the, the facts, kind of. You know, that sort of cutting meetings short, I can't cutting them short, because it's just about this sort of information exchange. Can I just add to it? I think it's on that point, I think something that we experienced was um, just that level of exhaustion that does come from this new way of working. And I think partly because we weren't uh, used to, you know, living our lives on, on video calls, um, I think uh, there was that new layer of exhaustion, but also, um, yeah, I think. Uh, I think we probably all got a little bit fitter now. I think we probably worked out little tricks and tips, and I think it has demonstrated to us that we can adapt, we can change, but change doesn't happen like this. Change takes time, and I think that's, you know, we like to think we can do it like this, and I think in many ways we had to snap pretty quickly, but not too hard on ourselves, I think, is a lesson as well when things aren't easy straight away. Yeah, I agree with you there. It's almost sort of carving that space out and tend to intentionally work on something. Um, so, I wouldn't mind just, I gave some information, some stats on education. Um, the, and I got an email during the week, it was an email to everyone, not to me, um, but to, um, from the Minister of Women, Minister Payne, and Minister of Sport, Mr. Colbeck. Um, and this is a program they've been running for a long time. And for those in sport, it might be um, of interest, but if you don't already know about it, it's individual grants of up to 10 grand for professional development and then 20 grand for professional development um, for employees within a, within a business. Um, now, we, the, the data says that um, equality isn't about a lack of education because Australia's got the highest education percentage in, in, in the world. Um, 
what do you think one you know how do we make these programs more more effective and two with this guy actually it was a um as a ceo friend in, in sport that will remain anonymous said this email to me and said what do you think i should do like didn't even realize sort of what how this should be used, which I thought was really interesting, and, and, and me too. I mean, this, this is relevant to me, I don't know what to do. I was interested in opinion, you know, in that space, but the creative. Uh, I might kick off, um, you know, the, the Women Leaders in Sport program is, is ours, the one you're referring to, which uh, I think is a great program, and we've been running that for 17 years. But the, but the problem that you raise is that it's static, so I mean, we've had so many people that have gone through the program and do the, uh, the personal development. And, and our objective is to get more females involved in sport. Just, so just to give you a, an indication, we've got, I, I look after 100 sports across the country, and we have six female CEOs. Um, and the league was one, so we went from seven to six. Um, we have, uh, I think we have two high performance directors who are females. Um, and so those stats are really, they're really alarming because our participation numbers uh, right now across all sport is 50-50. And so we, we, we need, you know, the, the whole concept of diversity is because we need, we need people who understand both male and female and we need that balance. You know, there's no, you know, just, just wanting to get women in because it's, it's real and diversity is real. And so we really need to get that um, that balance right, and we are we are miles six out of a hundred is that's just ridiculously unac unacceptable. But I think that what we're trying to do is is actually find what what is the hypothesis? What why are we not getting females? We're educating them, so you're right. Uh, we're providing that development, and the grants we've actually doubled this year. So in the past we've had up to five thousand. This year we've got up to ten thousand. Which actually means that we can cover things like the AICD course uh, for directors because we want to cover the whole spectrum. Not only do we want to get female uh, executives, and it doesn't necessarily have to be CEOs, but we also want to get directors. We can continue that, that funnel. Um, but we don't know why we're not getting people. We're educating them. Uh, we hold a Women Leaders in Sport conference uh, where we get 160 women together and uh, it's a terrific two-day opportunity to, to really work on your development and your confidence and, and we just need to get that next step. Um, and as a sector, we've got, and, and you know, Lee and I have had many discussions about this, as a sector, you know, we need to pave the way for that to, to happen. And that's not doing anything over and above, but we need to create that, that pathway so that women do get the experience and the opportunity and are prepared and confident enough to actually go in to undertake those roles. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a complicated one and I think it's really refreshing to hear Rob talk about the importance of the grants but also the recognition that it's not shifting the dial because it's not. Um, we have the same stats year after year and uh, it's, while it's important and I think Georgia, you said, you know, we're the most educated country um, I'll just say in the world because that sounds better, but I'm not sure if that's right. But if you say it with confidence, it, it, it'll be fine. But I, what I do know is that when I coach women, which I sort of have in the past, the first thing they'll come in and say is, do you think I need to do an MBA or do you think I need to do this? The education is the go-to. You know, we, we can't get any further. Should I add something to my, my repertoire? And, and my answer is yes, if you want to. MBAs cost a lot of money. Are you going to put that on your own bottom line? in the future, think about it in, in, in those terms as a return on investment. But parallel to the education piece, uh, sorry, so stepping back one sec, the, the education piece is also important because women need a safe leadership space in which to explore what it means to be a leader and to develop their own leadership muscle. So it is still really important and, and I'm a massive supporter of, of the grants and, and women and organisations really thinking into how they might utilise those. And I thank Rob um, for his support on that, of course. But, but parallel to that, we need to be thinking about system and structures because it's the system and structure of sport that is holding women back. Um, for example, if, if uh, you know, most CEOs are coming from a CFO perspective, well, we're not seeing a lot of female CFOs. 
Why not? Where are the black holes? Most women are sitting in coordinator management kind of levels and not actually finding their way through. It's a system problem. So how can we in parallel create education for the sector uh, on conscious bias? How to actually sponsor talent through um, the pipeline? How do we even identify talent in the pipeline? Sport's never been really good at succession planning. We, we do it in sort of bite-sized pieces. We say, oh, we're really flat management structures. That's all, you know, excuses dressed up as reasons, really. If we're brave enough, we'll look into it. We'll figure out where the black holes are. We'll figure out a, 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 a strategy, but also the education of everybody about um, how we create more inclusive culture is really important. Just on that, I found it really interesting that 160 women turn up for a leadership conference, but then, I mean, where are we, where are we losing them? Do we, is it sort of, do we need to do a, a mentoring program on the way through? And, and I, I find it interesting, um, like we were talking before, my board seat at Rowing Australia was an appointed one rather than an elected one. And so if we talk about sort of systems, there's, there's something, something there as well. Can, can we sort of discuss that a bit further? I don't think we've got enough time to talk about the system <laughs> of the uh, federated model. We've all seen that with, uh, with government, Georgia. But um, I, I think you're spot on. We've been running this conference and, and everybody is fired up. It, it, it's no different in business. I mean, I, you know, I've been in business for 35 years and you go along to a conference and you come home and you say, I'm going to change my life. Um, and then the real life kicks in the following day. And uh, I, I think I think there's a stat that you've got 16 days to put something new into place or you forget it. Um, and, and, and so I think what we've got to do is we've just got to be persistent. You know, we've got to follow up. You're right, mentoring is a really critical moment, a really critical thing we've got to do. But we've just got to be persistent. We can't just let that conference go and 12 months go by and we haven't done anything about it. So we've got to find those people. We've got to keep. We've got to keep talking to them. We've got to keep talking to sports. So in our sector, and we've got to get them to accept that diversity is really important. And I, I did want to. I, did, I, I, I wanted to say about diversity. And I had an amazing experience. And I see Kane Liddell sitting over there, um, and he'll remember this as well. In 2004, I, I became a director of the Richmond Footy Club, and um, at the same time, Peggy O'Neill became a director. It was the first female on the board of the Richmond Footy Club ever. Um, and I won't tell you about the meetings we had before, Peggy, because you know nine men sitting around a table talking about wanting to whether we signed Matthew Richardson or not was uh, you know was becoming a bit draining. But, but Peggy said something to me which made me realise what diversity was. And we were, every footy club sets a tone, they set a, a, a positioning statement every year. And, and often they, you know, they change that positioning statement. And, and Richmond's positioning statement had always been eat alive. And Peggy was, she was the only female on the board and she said, you know what, I actually don't like eat alive. And everyone was, oh, all women, shock horror, shock horror. You know, this, is the, this is what we've always said. And she said, because if I think about women, I don't necessarily want to be yelling out, eat them alive, at the footy. And I think that if you want to be attracting members to the, to the game, you, you need to have a different uh, positioning statement. And in fact, we, we, from that moment, we actually went on, and I remember Kane doing it, actually looked at the, um, at the demographic that we were aiming for, and we actually came up with a number of positioning statements. And, and, and now, of course, Richmond's got 105,000 members. And, you know, it, that was a moment where I thought, wow, I would never have thought of it. As, as a mother, I would never have thought of it. And, and here was a different, a different view. And I think, you know, we've got to get that diversity. We've got to get those views uh, that uh, we get into our organisations and, and sport, you know, in particular. And I'm interested to hear your sort of views on that. Like, on the, sort of, education front and yeah. how it could be better supported? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting, um, really interesting topic because I think uh, for a lot of the research that I've been across around this uh, topic in particular, not so much specific to sport, but just women's participation and, and, and opportunities for leadership in general across business, etc., is that you know, there's plenty of research to say that women are less likely to step forward. We, we are less likely to put our hand up for opportunities. Um, and I don't like to admit that um, as a female myself, but I also 
uh, I absolutely see it in my uh, you know, friends and colleagues. Um, so if this is the case, if the statistics show that men are more likely to put their hand up for a new promotion or opportunity uh, than women are, um, we need to help each other, we need to mentor each other, we need to hold each other's hands, we need to uh, you know, promote other women who are doing incredible things, we need to share those stories, but we do need programmatic change as well and I think it's having those right systems and processes in place, whether it be in sport, whether it be in business, to help support women and pull them up also. So identifying women who are demonstrating uh, the right uh, you know, you know, skills and attributes and ambition and, and, and really helping them on that journey because the reality is we're all there. These women are there. Um, and they're just not getting those opportunities. And I think the problem is they're probably also sometimes waiting to be asked. And um, we can't wait to be asked. Someone said to me very early in my career, hey, no one's going to manage your career for you. You have to take ownership in your own career. And for me, as a very young, uh, you know, entry level executive at, at CV, so bigger industry, you know, one of Australia's biggest, uh, well, Australia's, well, Australia's biggest group, but um, male dominated, that sort of environment. I was being told by my manager, hey, okay, this is what you need to do. And to be honest, it was a really important magic point in my career to, to realise, hang on a second, yes, I don't need to wait for someone to tap me on the shoulder. I need to demonstrate my value and put my hand up when I see there's something that I want to chase. And, and look for mentors, seek out people who can help me on that journey. And, you know, we, only, even on this time of your day, you've got Leaky, who's a great example of someone who's really uh, championing, you know, uh, strong female, female leadership in sport. And I think if there's others in the room who, who see that as something they'd like to do, reach out, you know, look to these, these women, because I'd like to be part of it as well. So we're not, we're not necessarily looking at hands up. I guess on the back of what you're saying, Kate, um, just a quick story. When I became the CEO of Swimming Australia, uh, the um, female leader in the sector called Rolf's predecessor actually and said, I didn't even realise that I could have applied for that job. If, if Lee can do it, I can do it. I didn't take that as a negative, like as Lee's crap, so I'm better, you know, better be fine. I took it as... It's, it's hard to, um, I guess, sometimes conceptualise things you can't see, and so once people are in those roles, it seems just that's a tad a bit easier. Um, so yes, we are a bit reticent to put it, put our hands up. When I resigned my role, Chatham House story, uh, a, a guy who had never worked in sport administration, who was a journalist and just happened to be a father of a swimmer, called one of the board members and said, hey, you've got your guy, I'll, I can do that job, where do I sign up? And so it was just a really good reminder to me that yes, you know, men are putting their hands up before they're even thinking about what the criteria sheet is. And women are reading that criteria and saying, gee, I haven't got half a percent on that number 10, I better just wait until I've got it. You never want a job that you can nail, you actually want a job that's a stretch or a reach particularly in leadership. So why would you even go for a job if you think you can nail everything? Um, that's part of the, the richness of, of career. And I guess the last point, back to um, thinking about 160 at the conference, we're going to stop preaching about diversity to women. Um, they're not the fixers. Uh, men championing women, men standing beside women to, to make it. So 160 men and 160 women talking to male chairs, talking to male CEOs about diversity and women's experience. And I think we are learning the value of listening to women's experience in our world right now. I couldn't agree more. And, um, on a, even just in meetings, having sort of diversity, and, I mean, I, I find that women will champion other women and, and have their backs in the room when they are serving up some truth with some people that might not necessarily want to hear the truth. Um, and we're actually, it, it shouldn't just be women championing other women in the room, it should, should absolutely be women. We hear this a lot though. Um, but it's just a, a reminder. Um, I'm, as a bit, the slight 
um, sort of change in, in topic. Um, I sent out some questions to the, um, the panel during the week, none of which I've actually asked today, so they've been good sports today. Um, but one of them was um, about um, our call-out culture and whether um, that's um, positively affecting um, women in a, in the, there's a, a channel for, for truth to come out or is it adversely affecting and has it gone too far? Um, I was waiting for an email blast back with that question because it's a loaded question. I mean, what is call out culture? Is it something that the Murdoch media put together? Um, I'm just interested in, you know, I don't even know how I feel about the word itself, let alone the sort of bigger topic. Um, can, we, can we discuss this? Who wants to go first? Um, so, to me, uh, yeah, it's, it is, it's an interesting one. I think, in reality, I think it has gone a little bit too far. Um, so, um, in terms of the importance of having a conversation and people having a voice, I think the reality is uh, social media, for example, has given everyone a voice and it's given us the opportunity to uh, highlight um, when uh, you know, obviously there's inequality at play, but ultimately I think uh, for the quality to happen, there needs to be, uh, well, ultimately not a winner and a loser, and I think at times uh, we are a little bit too quick to jump, um, and ultimately some of the conversations are becoming a little bit toxic, um, and uh, yeah, what is being, I guess, call out culture, and um, what is being uh, through and through probably social media, I think. It's sometimes a little bit, uh, it's not necessarily uh, useful, is it is my feeling on that. I'd probably like to, the, the way that we've dealt with it, uh, and it may not be right, certainly in, in sport, I think, uh, in the last 12 months, when we're when we're looking at filling positions, whether they be high performance directors or CEOs, or even COOs, you know, trying to create that pathway, um, the, the call-out culture, you know, we, we, we've just done it from an honesty perspective in, in following up and asking whether, you know, the organisation considered the balance. So really not making it an aggressive way, but just making it a constructive way. And, and that has worked. There was one, um, one sport where we just asked, you know, what were the, the quality of the female candidates for a particular role? And the CEO said, that's actually a really good point. I, I actually didn't think about it, but we only had, we only chose males to be shortlisted. And so he then accepted that challenge and went back and re-looked at the CVs for the shortlist and actually found uh, a candidate that he thought was pretty good. And that candidate got the job. It was through the female. So I don't think it needs to be really aggressive or in your face. Um, it can be done really constructively. And I think we've, we've tried to do that constructively and try to look at where uh, you know, one of our CEOs just took on a new, a new, uh, a new role, and you know, we, we want to try and build a way to make sure that she's going to be successful in that role. All driven by her, not not making her feel inadequate, but you know, just having those conversations with, you know, the the, the male directors or male chairmen of, of the organisation. So, I, I I still feel it can be done like everything. You know, we don't need to be aggressive to get change. You know, we need to be practical, and we need to be able to get across our point. Um, and and I think that's the way. You know, persistence. You know, working with people, don't impose things on them. Get them to make the the realization that there could be a better answer. Yeah, like you, Georgia, I'm I'm probably a bit mixed by the I guess the term. I've I've seen it used now really destructively in terms of being really reducing a conversation down you know, oh, that's just call out culture, so therefore it doesn't matter. And again, you, you are silenced, which is actually, the irony is that you're trying to have a voice, you're trying to have something to say. So it, it doesn't serve a purpose. I think like Rob, respect and kindness is completely paramount, but also is um, being very assertive about what needs to change and, and why that needs to change. Uh, I think it's missing the nuance of conversations that need to be had. Um, we are now living in a time where the currency of ideas is all we've got. And sport's just about that. People are all we have. We don't sell widgets. We're not on a factory floor. 
that the, the total sum of people in your organisation at any point in time is, is the, the equation of high performance. And so if those people don't feel safe um, to speak out, you may be missing the nuggets that will push you, you know, those one percenters to use a, a, a silly analogy. And so I think it's incumbent upon leaders to try and uh, look into their culture and say, well, if, you know, if we, if we want to avoid really toxic call-out uh, culture, how do we do the reverse? How do we make people feel um, an integral part of the team? And that when something does need to be called out, how do we do that? Think about it ahead of time, you know, and give people those tools to be able to do it in a really constructive manner. Can I just add, um Again, I think it can be it can be really constructive. So uh, on International Women's Day, my uh, choose to challenge is the challenge gen gender imbalance on panels and conferences. So well done, everybody. We've got a good uh, we've got a good mix. But I, I've done, I've had that for the last twelve months, and without doing it in a really aggressive way, there are a number of conferences that I've actually refused to speak at because they haven't thought about it, and I won't just do it as a no, I'm not speaking, um, but talk to them about and. Talk to them about finding that right balance, and I will go and find them someone to speak. You know, the number of times that I've spoken on panels with five men, and it's just not acceptable. So, you know, bringing bringing people in and thinking about it just means that the next time, and I've had that feedback a lot. You know, next time, yeah, we will we will consider that because they don't they think about who they're trying to get, not the message you're trying to get across. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's almost like the the label um, call up culture or just to call someone out is is geared with all the, the negative connotations rather than you know if we correct someone and say oh you mean just telling the truth um, rather than have the title that the media like to put on the, on the front page I just I think that there needs to be pathways for, for truth and, and respect for someone's opinion you might not necessarily agree but that's what they're telling you and so I find I find that concept just fascinating and we could talk about it for hours, but we won't. Um, all right, now we're going to go to question time in a sec. I just want to do one loop around. Tell me um, what what are we seeing? Um, like leaving on a bit of an optimistic note. What are we seeing that is great that we want to double down on this year? Or reflecting on on the year? We want to just yeah, something good. No pressure. Um, three things possibly. Panel pledge that Rob just spoke Rob just spoke about is really, really critical and has shifted things in a in a very subtle but very powerful way. And I think you don't need to be a CEO to be able to do that. Everything you're invited to when you get an opportunity to speak or be part of a workshop or whatever, to actually double check that women are included and women have a voice. Um, and if they're not, maybe there's a couple of things you can uh, suggest somebody or you can take somebody with you. Uh, I think that's a really powerful and yet subtle way to change things and I love that, particularly in sport and our champions of change that we work with, 21 organisations, uh, 17 uh, male CEOs, they are all very committed to that panel pledge and it changes the diet. Uh, in sport, we love a good panel, don't we? We love it. Um, it's too easy, we've got to do better. Um, second thing is I'm loving at the moment and being very inspired by young women and young women's advocacy and young women's voices keep going, keep doing it. You haven't, it seems like you haven't got the fear like the old guts have sometimes and you've got the platform so you know I'm right behind you and, and I know we all are so please keep doing that. The other thing that I'm doing this year um, being and I'm very inspired by is one day, one woman a day on Instagram, Women of Sports. I'd love you to all follow it. Um, I'm uh, profiling one incredible female leader in sport for 365 days, similar to Kirsten Ferguson's Celebrating Women campaign that you might have seen a couple of years back. Uh, I've unashamedly ripped that off from her with her permission, so it's not a, it's not a new concept. But the power of telling stories and the power of getting behind women uh, to at once they've shared that story, which can be sometimes very courageous and very great. Uh, it's been incredible, and so every morning I wake up uh, completely inspired about what we can achieve by just doing those simple little things individually and collectively. 
Um, so if I, um, um, I guess, small from my perspective from a, a business and potentially retail side of things, um, I think in, in my sector there's some really interesting and fantastic things happening. Um, on the on the man panel uh, comment, um, Kate Morris, who's a, the CEO of the Door Beauty, which I think many people in the room probably ordered a little box from Door Beauty over their times. She's been a, a huge advocate for uh, yeah, removing these man panels as such, and uh, I actually really wish she sat the other day, which obviously is a, is, is a really good one, I think, which is 80% of retail decisions are made by women, uh, yet, yet you know, so so few women are represented at a leadership level on the um, Australian or international retail boards. So um, having that constant push for, for leaders within uh, the industry is really important, and I think Kate Morris is doing a great job. I think um, groups such as business chicks, which uh, many people in this room are probably really familiar with. Um, you know, Emma Isaacs is an amazing champion of change herself. She's, she's driven a, a really fantastic movement there. So if those in the room who uh, aren't familiar, check it out, have a look at what Emma Isaacs is doing. It's it definitely cross borders, uh, Australia and, uh, and into the US. Uh, but fantastic events, really profiling some incredible women doing some, some really fantastic things. Um, and then finally, uh, when it comes to more the startup space, um, venture capital, access to capital, um, you know, there's, there's been a, for a long time, well, for a there's been disparity in where the, the, the funds are flowing into more for the male, male than businesses. Um, and there's now more and more VCs that are actually popping up that are really starting to focus more on championing women and women-led businesses. Um, and particularly, I mean, in Australia, here we've got scale, we get to the US, there's, there's several, and I mean, many of you would have read even the last uh, month or so in the press, obviously, the, the success story of Bubble, and, um, and uh, there, for example, now, Whitney is uh, starting her own uh, Bubble Fund as well, so really focusing on women's and female leadership entrepreneurship, which I think is a really fantastic, uh, fantastic way of the place. So it's really, really, really great things happening. It's just about, um, yeah, it's all kind of seeking them out and I think looking for, for the positives uh, and not getting caught up in, in the barriers. Fantastic. Um, I think from, from my perspective in sport, it's hard not to be excited. Uh, we've got a, an Olympics, which will go ahead. Um, and a great opportunity for us to see some, some great male and female athletes and become role models and inspire future generations to want to be involved with sport. So I think that's incredibly exciting. And I think then, you know, you bookend that with the prospect of, of 2032, um, which is, is just so exciting for us to now get some of the, the things we're doing, you know, by, by being able to get, you know, some balance, you know, within the leaders because we, we, we really do need that. And I think that's exciting as well. And, and really driving it, not just doing it and saying, there you go, that's, there's another conference done, you know, and, and what Lee's doing uh, and Champions of Change and uh, what she's doing personally is really helping that, you know, we're getting the message out there. It's, there every day. So that's really exciting. Um, you know, we really just want to increase participation. We've had um, a major challenge because people s have stopped doing what they've always done. And human nature is you fill that with something else. And what we're seeing is real challenges around our participation numbers. So people going and playing sport. Uh, and most importantly, volunteers. And so I'm really excited. We're, we're trying to run some uh, some programs around getting more volunteers back and not just come and do a role, but really outlining what the, the value of a volunteer is. I would not be sitting here now if I did not volunteer to be a hockey coach when I was 17 years of age. Because the people I met in that hockey club that actually took me under their wing and took me through to, the, to be what I am, you, know, you just can't, you can't pay for that experience. So I think, you know, there's, there's so much happening from a sport perspective, there always is, uh, which is all really exciting, so. Well, thank you very much, panel. Now, over to the hard-hitting questions from the audience. Who would like to start? We, we might have a roaming mic. Nope, I'm going to give you the mic. Good morning. Thank you for an amazing discussion this morning. I really enjoyed hearing everyone's sort of takes on everything. And 
I really need to understand probably from the point of Kate and maybe not as well, just about sort of the balance of parenting and wanting to be a really guy if you're already in a sector being small or with love, but also wanting to have that sort of family life and that's probably coming a little bit later in life now. So wanting to balance that being a leader, but also wanting to be a mum and what advice do you give to people? I'll pick off and then I'll pass over and leave you a perspective. We were actually just chatting a little bit about this this morning. Um, look, I think there's not one way to do it. Everyone's going to have their individual, individual approach to how they're going to, to manage that mix should you, you know, wish to take on a leadership role and, and have a family. Um, I say to anyone who wants to, do it. It's very fulfilling, but I'm not going to pretend that it's not difficult at times and messy at times um, and uh, yeah I think the reality is it takes a lot of uh, planning good conversations having a, a good team so uh, you know in my world I'm really lucky to have a, a great partner and husband um, we as I said we're a team at work and at home and that's actually been really critical to how we make it work um, we do share the load. Um, he's got the kids this morning, so I can come here. Um, we do run our own business, so it gives us a little bit more flexibility to be able to say, okay, well, he's going to be in the office late today, or he's not going to be on that call. So it does afford a level of flexibility, the fact that we are running our own show. But um, I think for women who are wanting to do it, I definitely say do it. Um, and it's just about probably talking to more and more women about how, how they manage it. And I think it's our job as women who have gone down that path to actually share what happens behind the scenes because uh, it's not straightforward to work out. And um, I'm not going to pretend that my life's perfect, and, um, but it's a constant balance between uh, family priorities and business priorities. But I'd like to think that by doing what I'm doing, I'm actually setting a good example my girls that um, you know women can if you want to you can lead you can build you can go on and do something and I think uh, I want them to not see gender as a barrier I want them to grow up feeling like they don't even have to consider gender in terms of opportunity it is uh, you know opportunity and whether you're a male or a female uh, is there for the taking um, yeah, this is a great question, thank you. And we could talk for you know many hours on it and everyone's journey is a bit different. I had a baby at 28, 31 and 36 um, and every experience and, and every time we added a kid it's been interesting as well. Um, I guess I, I hate giving advice. My pieces that worked for me, uh, switch off Instagram with that fluffy, bloody black and white photo of parenting and the newborn and the, you know, it doesn't exist, it never did. Um, it exists in some other um, sphere. Uh, drop your expectation of perfect. Kids don't understand what that is. Uh, they're really simple. Feed them, water them, love them, you know, that's it. And then remember to do that for yourself. Some days I high five myself and think, fantastic, I've nailed this. I, I promise you, every time I get a bit um, giddy with my own success on that the next day, I, I promise the house of cards falls down. Uh, so many times I've been travelling as a CEO or whatever and I'm in Sydney and Andrew's somewhere else in the country or whatever with, with Carlton and someone inevitably will rip me and say, Jasper's just broken his arm or whatever. So it's almost just get comfortable with chaos. Perfect is an illusion. And probably just picking up on Kate's um, part, I think one of the lucky things that I've had in my life, being involved in football for a long time, is the network of women around me. So while I've felt very much like I'm on my own a lot, especially in the early days when Andrew was trying to establish his career, uh, the women that have um, appeared, you know, co other coaches' wives, um, administrators' wives and so on, have become family. So my concept of asking for help and, and whatever always was expanded into that room rather than expecting uh, Andrew to kind of share the load, which to be really frank, he doesn't and never will. Um, but I also in my old age have stopped expecting too much but, but also stopped um, 
kind of covering that up for him. So he's at home with the kids this morning. He freaked out, sorry, Kane, he's going to be late for work. But I said, look, that's, you know, your problem. Um, you work it out. Very good. Um, yeah, do you want to do the yell? Yeah, uh, you touched on the start of sort of transitioning to a working kind of sort of society. I guess my question is how are we going to, as leaders, I guess, how are we dealing with mental health when we don't have that face to face interaction? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the question was working from home and sort of transitioning back into the office now, how, you know or trying to, um, how we're managing mental health um, without that face-to-face -face interaction and, and checking in with, our, with our people. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a, um, a stab at that because this is all brand new. Uh, I found, um, I mean, we've got 600 people and, um, and it's spread out over the country. And so we found that there were some people who uh, really needed to come to work. Um, and we, being in Canberra, we made that option available and for those that we couldn't, you know, we tried to make sure that we were, you know, people and culture team, we were communicating with everybody, not, not in a really invasive way, but, but in a way to understand who might be vulnerable. And as time went on, you know, particularly those in Melbourne, you know, there was a lot of communication with them. I think that the challenge now is to get them back integrated. So some people have just become really, I call it institutionalised, but I think that they've become set in that way that you know that they they're just going to continue. And that is, I, I know in my personal circumstances, 111 days in lockdown, you know, I'm a pretty confident individual, but I, I found myself really struggling mentally. And uh, and I spoke to my people and culture team about it. And in fact, I I, I said to him, I told everybody at the organisation that it was really difficult, and you shouldn't be a hero. Um, you should try and get some assistance. So uh, we're really geared for that. I think that there's been a major shift away to make sure that we can help people with those uh, those difficulties and, and also making sure uh, we did things like sending to, to other states, particularly in Melbourne, we sent care packages just to put a smile on their face, you know, a Mars bar and, uh, you know, a couple of things like that that we, that we did, that the, that the team were doing just to make sure that they knew that there was someone else with them because it's the loneliness, you know, you're dealing on a screen, most people would go to a bubble rather than be on the screen, you know, they wouldn't get themselves up and get themselves dressed in work clothes, they would just hang around in tracky pants, all the things that are just, you know, just, just impact you, so. Um, just to add on to that,
maybe just a couple of quick things. Uh, don't be afraid to listen and, and don't underestimate the power of listening. I think we, f we reach for the complex complexity sometimes in mental health. Um, being present and creating that space for people just, just to listen can often move them through uh, their current challenge. Don't be afraid of tackling it. I think we're really frightened sometimes as leaders to do the wrong thing or to say the wrong thing. Uh, I would I would offer up that uh, you know if you are there in an authentic, transparent, and, and trusting way, that won't happen. Um, and I think the way that I, I I like to lead through you know some pretty psychologically tough times in, in you know in that lockdown was the concept of tight, loose, tight. You know, tight on what they're doing. You know, so they make sure they know what they're doing, but loose on how they're doing it or when they're doing it and then tied on KPIs you know, you, and, and outcomes. You can still be um, in that space, but you can be flexible in so many ways about how to get the job done, and I think that sometimes helps people. Now, breakfast has arrived, so I'm going to have to cut question time off. Can we please thank our panellists? <laughs> check in on the, the state of sport and, and business uh, for International Women's Day and, and as adults we can see these challenges and use our brains to, to navigate and overcome them. Um, but you know the interesting thing about sport is there's this phenomenal picture in our living rooms um, or live in a stadium where, they, where we see women playing sport equally smart, fast and, and strategic and it's almost a subconscious primitive view um, of women um, being strong in body and mind. And it completely transforms our living room. For me, it's driving to work and I'll see a billboard with a physically fit, strong woman, woman and it's inspiring. Um, it's women showing the world that they can do anything. Um, and for men and young boys, um, it's important they see that, um, uh, that, that, and that they're sort of, it's, a, it's an example. Um, but for young women and and older women, it's a reminder um, of what we can do. Um, sport is such a powerful tool, um, and um, yeah, keep keep doing your amazing things, um, business people and, and sports people. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us here today, and thank you for your questions. Um, let's give these wonderful panelists a round of applause. Again. <laughs> Coffee and food, let's do it.